This is Fortune's Wheel, a podcast history of the late Middle Ages. I'm your host, Jonathan, and this is episode two, The Battle of Malden. I hope you enjoy the show. In the book Upheaval, Turning Points for Nations in Crisis, author Jared Diamond says, quote, Nations and individuals accept national and individual responsibility to take action to solve the problem, or else deny responsibility by self-pity, blaming others, and assuming the role of victim, end quote. You know, say what you will about King Ethelred of England, but he made a choice. And the unfortunate thing about history is the right answer is only ever clear after the event, in the future, never in the present. After the Battle of Malden in 991, Ethelred's present had two roads, and though every nobleman had an opinion, not a single one, including their king, knew which was the right course of action to take. And being king, it was ultimately his choice. As Diamond said at the top of the show, Ethelred must accept national responsibility and then take action to solve the Viking problem. If not, essentially he'll deny his sole purpose as king and assume the role of victim. And so will all of England. He had two paths, two roads. Neither was clear. And I would argue only one was the right one for England, But both were right for those pesky Vikings. In hindsight, Ethelred made the wrong choice, but I strongly caution those reflecting on it today or even 50 years after his choice was made to reserve too harsh of criticism. I mean, given the circumstances, what would you have done? After roughly three centuries of sporadic Viking domination over the islands of England and Ireland, this was precisely where King Ethelred found himself. He could order action to solve the problem, or he could continue to allow the Danish warriors to hold a dominion of fear over his subjects, as well as his neighboring kingdoms. Regardless of what King Ethelred thought or said, though, an elderman of Essex named Britnoth, working separately from his king, more or less, decided to amass a force to meet these Vikings where they next landed. His local militia, mostly collected along the way, no doubt, were an odd mixture of soldiers, farmers, and artisans, along with his corps of warriors loyal to him above all else. But march they did down to the marshy fields one mile east of the village of Malden, along the coast of the North Sea. There, across a sunken causeway, they saw a menacing fleet of Northmen, fresh off raiding the coastal towns of Folkestone and Sandwich in Kent, This fleet was anchored on a smallish island called Northy Island today, at the mouth of River Blackwater, separated from the mainland by that sunken path. The tide was in. It is said that there was no real draw to Malden specifically. Rather, it seemed a good spot to land and collect themselves after the most recent raids. However, we can imagine the response of the leader of the raiding party, again, presumably Olaf Tryggvason, if you remember, as he watched a line of Saxons walking toward their placement on the island, standing a mere two football pitches away, Olaf might have initially smiled amusedly, called his comrades to look, and they might have all grabbed their battle axes and swords and shields and began shouting across the submerged causeway with shrieks of mania and frightening war cries. I wonder, in their pride, if they even laughed. On the opposite bank, this elderman of Essex might have dismounted his horse, breathed in deeply at the monumental task ahead of him, and as he walked toward the shoreline, he might have remembered tales of Alfred the Great and his indisputable triumph over the Vikings a mere two centuries before. These men called across the waterway, negotiating at first, maybe a peace. According to the epic poem written a couple decades, or a couple, excuse me, a couple years after the battle, called the Battle of Malden, Olaf offered a payment for peace, 
If the Saxons would simply pay a fee, Olaf would lead his men quietly away and not return. This was actually a common discussion among the noblemen of the day across England. Many, including King Ethelred, ironically again, a descendant of the Saxon conqueror of the Vikings, Alfred the Great. King Ethelred was a proponent of such a payment. It's hard, really, to determine how each individual felt as records weren't written and preserved in those days, but according to the poem, well, Britannoth's opinion was crystal clear on whether he agreed with his king or not. The poem has Britannoth saying this, quote, Sea Raider, can you hear what this army is saying? They intend to give you all of you spears as tribute, deadly points and tried swords, payment in war gear, which will be of no benefit to you in battle. Here stands with his company an earl of unsustained reputation who intends to defeat his homeland, the kingdom of Ethelred, my lord's people and his country. They shall fall, the heathens in battle. It appears to me too shameful that you should return to your ships with our money unopposed, now that you thus far in this direction have penetrated into our territory. You will not gain treasure so easily. Spear and sword must first arbitrate between us the grim game of battle before we pay tribute. End quote. It's worth noting here that it's highly unlikely that the poet himself was actually at the battle in Malden. Any survivor would probably have been seen as a coward and largely shunned, as, spoiler alert, you'll soon see. And the poem was composed sometime between probably the spring of 992, after word of the battle had reached across England, and maybe the year of 1000. So the exact details are still sketchy, but it's what we have. Did Britannoth utter these words? Well, most certainly, he probably didn't. However, was Britannoth a highly respected Saxon nobleman who led his loyal contingent of warriors along with an army of free men to Malden to confront Olaf and his fleet of 90 ships and upwards of 4,000 men? Most certainly, Britannoth did. In essence, take the poem for what it is, entertaining and compelling art about a real and pivotal event and without a doubt embedded with subtle propagandistic nuance. Britnoth, the epitome of a Saxon noble. Britnoth, a hero to young Saxon boys. Britnoth, an ideal for all Saxon men. Britnoth was also, it is said, to have been almost seven feet tall and over 60 years old, giving him a commanding presence on the battlefield. He inspired his men, it says, here stands with his company, he shouts to his enemy for all to hear. And he inspired his kingdom, this man who states clearly and boomingly that he intended to, quote, defend his homeland, the kingdom of Ethelred, my lord's people, end quote. Though these words, again, may never have left Br Britannoth's lips, the sentiment of the moment in its historic context was most likely spot on. At what point is a group of people willing to bear all wounds and commit any sin so that his community and his progeny may live on in peace? There is no one answer to this question, but Britnoth and his company of Saxon countrymen offer us a clue. Someone noticed the sea beginning to ebb. The causeway was becoming clearer under the lapping waters of River Blackwater. In nearly every ancient religion or philosophy of self-change, Sacrifice is key. Sacrifice requires a person to establish what is willing to be given up in order to achieve one's goals. Great leaders may eat last, but they always sacrifice first. Britannoth sends his kinsman, Wolfston, along with two of his fiercest warriors, Marcus and Elphir, to stand a few steps into the causeway as the water pulled away. Vikings poured onto the causeway, and these three Saxons held them off, using an age-old tactic of bottlenecking the opponent so only a few are allowed to attack at one time. Wolfston, Marcus, Elphir, they held the causeway. Olaf was forced into a position that few Vikings find, f ever found themselves in. Olaf had to ask permission. He knew Britnoth had won the first round, the first round being establishing the literal and metaphorical, quote, high ground, 
on the battlefield. But as we saw, Olaf didn't fly into a rage. He didn't continue to pour Viking after Viking across the causeway despite his own hurt pride. He didn't risk drowning his men by ordering them to swim the gap. Olaf Tryggvason was a clever man. The poem uses the term Ulfermode to describe Brittnoth in this moment, which has been compared to other German and Dutch derivations as hubris. The notorious fatal flaw so prevalent to Greek storytellers for over a thousand years already, seeping its way into a seemingly minor skirmish on England's marshy southeast corner. This might be the best explanation for this next move we ever get, but make no mistake, it would change the course of the battle. It would change the course of the next 80 years of European history, and this one decision would change the course of history as a whole, it's safe to say. Embarrassingly, with his giant opponent sitting on his horse across the causeway smiling, the great Olaf Tryggvason called his men back onto the island. Soon, Tryggvason calls across the shallow causeway. The typical Viking tactic of charging and terrifying and overwhelming the opponent with masses of bearded, screaming men, swinging swords and axes, simply could not happen so far here at Malden. Not with three men among a couple thousand able to fend off his horde, unshot arrows behind them drawn and trained on his men. Using this strategy to Britnoth's credit was a brilliant move. Undoubtedly, even Olaf had to admit as much. Unfortunately, as is so common in Greek tragedies, we only assume pride snuck into Britnoth's mind immediately after a cessation of hostilities. After, quote, the battle was won, so to speak. As Marcus, Elphir, and Wolfston rested momentarily, taking turns glancing back at their lord, awaiting further instructions, I imagine, Olaf yelled across the causeway and offered an alternative. To give credit where credit's due, I wonder if, assuming again, that though the actual words in the poem are false, the sentiment of Britnoth's confident threat earlier are true. I wonder if Olaf read this proud Saxon nobleman like a book. A man of 60 years, maybe eager for a place of immortality like Alfred the Great before him. After such an overwhelmingly brilliant move to plug the causeway, Olaf might have sought to use this man's possible sin of pride to his advantage. Olaf proposed a fair fight. Olaf asked to meet his mighty Saxon force on equal terms, terms upon which Saxons may show their superiority over the Vikings at long last. Little is known about how Olaf's forces made it across the causeway to engage Britnoth's army on the mainland, but the poem is what we have, and the poem, well, the poem isn't too kind to Britnoth maybe as a warning of hubris to future generations. The poet certainly makes real efforts to show a weakness in the Honorable Britnoth's character, that again of pride, and Britnoth inexplicably allowing, allowed the crossing. This decision has been scrutinized every which way over the last millennium, and we still have no answers better than hubris, I'm sorry to report. Due to Britnoth's decision to allow Olaf's Vikings to, cause, to cross the causeway and reassemble, the entire Saxon Ferd, or militia, had officially lost any high ground they once held. They were mere yards away from a huffing, enraged, barking mad contingent of the world's deadliest warriors, and I can't imagine what might have passed through their minds as they gripped their spears harder, set their shields a bit more firmly against their forearms, dug their boots into the wet soil to ensure a stronger footing. I imagine an eerie silence as both forces sized each other up. Olaf had a few options before, but now strategies opened up as he found himself with a full force on equal footing as his opponents. Besides, Olaf Tryggvason almost certainly had a Viking secret weapon, the Berserker. We've mentioned how a lot of unfounded stereotypes have been slung at the Vikings throughout history, such as horned helmets and whatnot, but the infamous Berserker is not one of them. These warriors were the real deal, and they were characterized by the unbelievable level of rage they entered battle with, hence the word berserk entering into the English lexicon meaning, quote, to lose one's mind. Originally, this word had two possible origins. The first origin was said to have translated to bare shirt, as in no shirt at all. 
This refers to these berserkers entering into battle enraged, spitting, and growling like bears with no armor, no visible armor covering their bodies. And the second meaning is one who changes into a literal bear in battle. Yeah, a literal bear. Either way, whether a Viking actually went in shirtless or became an actual bear, the one thing both descriptions emphasize is, well, this guy was a maniac. To go berserk meant to change form in its original meaning, which has been interpreted in a few ways, but one that dates back to contemporary accounts was that they would literally, again, change into a bear, the animal. There's a lot to unpack there, especially from a psychological standpoint, but suffice it to say that these were formidable and dangerous foes to meet on the battlefield. In the saga of Rolf Kraki, a Viking warrior by the name of Bodvar Bjorki fought loyally and fiercely for his king, the namesake of the saga. It reads, quote, Men saw that a great bear went before King Rolf's men, keeping always near the king. He killed more men with his forepaws than any five of the king's champions, end quote. Berserkers can be traced back to far northern bear cults, groups devoted to honoring the mighty bear. And that traditional lineage can be found even today in the Danish royal family personal guards who wear caps made of bear skin. On a side note, these berserkers are the ones we recognize most when thinking about Viking warriors, but they weren't alone in the Viking world. On the contrary, little is known about these other groups, but there are records of other Viking military orders, for lack of a better term. One such order is called the Ulfenar, and when attributed to the god Odin, these warriors wore wolf skin going into battle, and like the berserkers in our next group to introduce, would drool and gnash their teeth and morph into their animal of choice, in this case the wolf again, and it is said that no fire, sharp point, or blunt instrument could harm them. Wolf cults, consisting of warriors channeling the spiritual wolf, are abundant across the Eurasian continent, but it seems the Vikings took it to a whole nother level. The other orders, uh, the other order of warriors who worship the veneer, a race of gods separate from the Asir in North, Norse mythology, and they took the veneer's sacred animal, the boar, as a means of inspiration. They called themselves Svenvilking. These warriors drew inspiration from the unexpected strength, the low center of gravity, and the fearlessness of the wild boar, complete, yes, with boar skin armor. In battle, this manifested as a battle tactic known to them, cleverly or unoriginally, as Svenvilking. To us, it's just called the wedge formation. See, Viking armies and raiding parties, though they have the stereotype of being mindless killers, there was utility in their raiding, as with, as with every other community around the world who sent raiding parties out. But there was also a high level of strategy otherwise, as any military leader or sports coach will tell you, everything will just fall apart the moment the initial whistle blows. Though there was a certain level of shock and awe in a Viking band of raiders storming your town, out on the open fields... A Viking leader needed to have other strategies up his bearskin sleeve. The Svenfilking was a very important military formation and was shared by the old Germanic tribes as well as by various warring nations long before. Two flanks would form up on either side of the wedge. Metaphorically, these were the nostrils of the boar's face. And the wedge in the middle would just, would just forward from the front line, it would jut out, meaning the snout of the boar. When everyone moved as a single unit toward the enemy, the wedge's point would pierce the opponent's line and effectively split their ranks in two. If the opponent wasn't employing their own strategy of, say, encirclement, that's a tactic in which your line forms a U-shape where your middle falls back and your two flanks stay forward along or allowing the enemy to engage your middle. This allows your flanks to close the circle, thus trapping your enemy inside your quote unquote arena of death at that point. If they're not using encirclement, then Svenvilking works out tremendously. 
Encirclement, as well as other battle strategies, are difficult to pull off, even with the most disciplined of soldiers. Just ask any youth football coach about running a sweep. It may seem simple, but getting everyone to work as a single unit can be very difficult. So, we can assume, without any evidence proving this statement right or wrong, mind you, that Britnoth's line of soldiers, farmers, and artisans probably didn't have that necessary training and cohesiveness to pull off something like uh, an effective encirclement strategy. We can also assume with the same caution that Olaf Tryggvason's men did have the experience to form up a variation of Sven Filking. Assuming the Vikings employ the wedge formation, there's no doubt that the gist of what's in the poem, The Battle of Malden, played out how it did. It's worth parsing the partially recovered poem. I say partially because it's only 320 lines left that, that from its original composition that we have. So it's worth parsing that insofar as finding a literary structure within it. Namely, Britnoth's belligerent response could very well be, as direct quotes go, just a mere fabrication, as it helps to round out the story of a man suffering from a crippling case of hubris. This is a powerful lesson to be taught in stories, especially those from the classical era, of which Europe has been taking the scenic route out of for the last 500 years, thanks to the rise of Christianity and the intensely violent censorship it brought with it across Europe, Northern Africa, and the Mediterranean. By the way, side note, I can't recommend highly enough the book The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie if you want to know more about the destruction of the classical worlds at the hands of early and medieval Christians. It's fantastic. So anyway, so as for this literary structure, the sentence, how mighty the giant falls, would probably have been a very recognizable features to stories told around the hearth. This motif is also found in the holy book of the Christians in the Old Testament, when David the shepherd takes on an overconfident Philistine giant named Goliath. In reality, the poem, The Battle of Malden, is the best source we have for the play-by-play -play commentary of this battle, as I've said, so there's just no telling exactly how it specifically unfolded. What we do know with certainty is that these Vikings, up to three or 4,000 strong, made their way across the causeway at low tide to meet the slightly smaller Saxon force. The poem has the Saxons launching headlong into battle and the Vikings meeting them in full force at this point. As these two sides ran at each other, one would have surveyed the battlefield and seen different types of weaponry and armor or experienced or excuse me, Britnoth's men, well, they probably didn't have the training that a standing army or experienced raiding band would ha have had, that's for sure. There were probably a few rakes and shovels in the crowd, but it's safe to say that due to many mentions of spears, that some sort of spear was used by both sides. However, the poet of the account mentions the spears as an Englishman's weapon, far more than a Viking one. What can we draw from that? Well, not much, except an understanding that the poet was English too. English, who therefore cared far more about describing his own countrymen rather than those beastly enemies. We also know from lines 71, 110, and 269 that arrows were launched, but no casualty count for either side is mentioned, unfortunately. We don't have that accuracy. Both English and Viking fighters were said to use swords, but as for body armor and shields, the evidence is iffy at best as to who had exactly what. For this episode, we'll assume, due to the account in the poem, that the majority of Englishmen did not have significant body armor, or any at all, for that matter, unlike the Viking contingent who almost always went into battle covered, unless they were a part of one of those military orders we talked about. You know, those military orders, they don't really like that show of weakness. The English did employ shields, largely, by contrast. We know this because the poet describes a shield wall, along the bank of River Blackwater, made up of the first line of Englishmen. It is said that Britnoth, the only man on horseback at this point, as others who rode out to the battlefield were ordered to send their horses away so as to deny them a hasty escape if the battle became too difficult. It's kind of an all-or-nothing thing here for Britnoth. So Britnoth rode up and down behind his line of soldiers, barking encouragement and tightening gaps in the shield wall. The Vikings, on the other hand, we don't really know for sure whether they entered battles with shields, at least on a uniformed, everybody kind of scale. The English shields used, thanks to archaeological evidence of the battle sites, were circular, 
and about the size of a man's torso. The outside edge was a rounded metal piece with a channel running along the inside which held wooden planks firmly in place. They weren't just used for personal defense either. In one scene from the poem, the English, possibly Britannoth himself, used it as a weapon against a Viking attacker when in close quarters. And finally, we know from extensive records of other Viking encounters that, though there was a chance of them carrying in shields, their other hand most likely held a battle axe or a spear along with a longsword at his side. The Vikings came prepared and were willing to do anything for the victory. Matt Nelson, a Viking combat expert, once said, quote, A Viking would not fight fair. He was there to win, to kill you, and to take your possessions, then bring them back and feed his family. End quote. I mean, it's that simple. There were no Geneva Conventions a thousand years ago. And even if there were, something tells me that the Vikings would have laughed heartily about it. Again, Vikings had been pestering and terrorizing northern European coastlines for centuries already. And the Angles and Saxons and Welsh and Picts and Irish, they were all well aware of these ferocious warriors, their intentions and the devastation they left behind. The stereotypes of Vikings weren't completely without merit. They were bearded, as we've said, and predominantly larger than those they encountered. Their raiding parties, such as the one Olaf Tryggvason commanded in 981, 10 years earlier, consisted of battle-hardened, experienced warriors giving the Vikings a marked advantage against the farmers and townspeople they encountered. Yes, Tryggvason was at, at, up to it for a long time before the Battle of Maldon. And their rumored rage and battle was also not exactly unfounded or unfair. The first clangs and booms could be heard, I imagine, when the breeze died down as far away as the edge of Malden. Screams would have immediately followed in the distance. Even faint. Britnoth jumped from his horse, the only one left out there when the battle began, and commanded his men until the Vikings broke through the line. We can imagine a bloody field indeed. There might have been scattered bodies of Englishmen and Vikings who would have possibly fallen from the lobbies of arrows and spears earlier, which might have interrupted the footing of many. Spears on both sides were used in the initial charge as they were primarily long-range weapons, or medium-range. But after the Vikings slammed into the Saxon shield wall and then broke through it, swords and battle axes would have been the weapons of choice. No doubt there were screams of agony and anger as well as shouts of orders from those in charge. Curses spat in both directions as metal pierced clothing and skin. The Vikings fought anyone and everyone they deemed beatable, while the Saxons fought for their lives of their families and their kingdom. The clinging and clanging of swords and the hard, deep knocks of the shields doing their jobs Minute after minute, however, the noise would slowly ebb as more and more men fell on both sides. For any journalist embedded with the Saxon force off to the side, the tweet might have read, quote, several minutes in, Saxons might actually pull this off, end quote. But the tide turned when, according to the poem, a Saxon soldier fled the battlefield, found Britnoth's horse, and rode away. Other Saxons saw this and assumed that Britnoth himself had fled. So they followed. Britnoth tried his best to call his men back while he fought valiantly against his Viking foes, but inevitably he fell to a Viking blow. This great elderman of Essex dropped to the muddy field, no doubt being stepped on by men pushing forward toward Malden. The Saxons had lost the battle. Many men died that day, muddied and bloodied, Many hundreds, if not thousands, of men would not return home, whether their homes were across the hillsides of Essex or wherever this mysterious band of Vikings hailed from. There were many fathers, brothers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, nephews, and cousins who gave their lives, some in defense of their homeland sovereignty, while others plundered enough to feed little ones in communities far across the North Sea. One thing is abundantly clear. However, the smallish skirmish one mile east of Malden in Essex would mark a turning point for the entire continent, in my estimation. This was a point that very subtly marked the beginnings of a change that's coming to not only the island of Britain, but also the mainland of Europe. Those Englishmen who fell at the mouth of River Blackwater in the late summer of 991, they would herald 
in a shift of policy that will not be apparent at first, but will soon extend well past Normandy and Aquitaine and Brittany. What is on the horizon for this wild northern stronghold, a place that not even the great Julius Caesar could tame a thousand years earlier, will influence not only the mighty Pope in Rome, but also the far-flung regions of Jerusalem in as little as 100 years. Shortly after Malden, King Ethelred was forced to meet the Viking leaders, again we assume Olaf Tryggvason, up the River Thames at a growing and still largely agricultural community formerly called Londinium by its Roman founders about 950 years earlier. Ethelred will be compelled to take the same deal many other Angle, Saxon, Pict, and Irish kings had for a couple centuries already. Ethelred agreed to pay a giant lump sum to this menacing Viking army in exchange for peace. We call this Danegeld, and this Danegeld will end up being the thing that sparks, arguably, one of England's darkest periods in its long history, all because of an unplanned skirmish in a tiny village on the coast of the North Sea. This one decision by Britnoth of allowing the Vikings to cross the causeway unopposed is as troubling as it is monumental. Had he not allowed Olaf's men to cross and engage on equal footing, one can only assume that Viking raids may have continued. But Olaf Tryggvason's reputation would have been tarnished. Britnoth might have ascended to the heights of historical greatness with King Alfred. King Ethelred might have avoided the choices that would lead to such an unfriendly nickname later. And maybe, just maybe, the Normans wouldn't have seen England 70 years later as a weakened, disunited land ripe for the taking. Maybe. We will pick up this story with the outcomes of the Battle of Malden and then shift to Saxon England's last death throes. In fact, this region and its people will play key roles in so many of the events of the next century. And I can't wait to tell you about it. Until next week.